Tamriel, Dawn's beauty in the language of the Altmer, or Tazukan in the dragon's tongue, is the continent upon which all the Elder Scrolls games take place. Home to many diverse races, and even more conflicts, Tamriel has been host to many adventures. You've experienced Tamriel in your own way, but want to learn more about its story? Well, to get to the heart of the story, you have to go back to the beginning. If the ancient stories are to be believed, then in a time before mortals, the gods ruled over Tamriel from their seat in High Rock. The Adamantine Tower stands as the single oldest structure in Tamriel, and it is said to be the place where the gods decided the fate of a newly formed planet called Nern. Perhaps this is merely myth, but when the ancient elves first stepped foot in High Rock, the tower was already standing leading us to believe that the history of Tamriel, and possibly Nern itself, begins at High Rock. High Rock, the westernmost province on the mainland of Tamriel, is a land of temperate climates and soft rolling hills, split in half by the towering mountains of the Reach. The quaint charm of its hamlets speak of a gentle life. With its fertile soils and generally climate weather, it is little wonder that the region, now known as High Rock, has attracted many cultures throughout its history, chief among them, the Bretons. The Bretons are a mixed breed, the descendants of both elven and human lineage. In appearance, they are more man than mer. Even so, they are sometimes crudely referred to as the mongrel race of Tamriel. Call them what you will but the Bretons benefit immeasurably as a hybrid race. Elven blood moves through their veins. The Bretons have a special talent for all things arcane. This genetic advantage makes the Bretons the strongest spellcasters among the other races of men. This, combined with their human descent, makes this race of mortals the most skilled battle mages in the realm. Intellectually, the Bretons are better compared to the Altmer, but physically, the Bretons most closely resemble their Nordic cousins in Skyrim. At first glance, this race is undoubtedly human, however, upon closer examination, you can see traces of their highborn ancestry. The Bretons are more frail than most all their human cousins, and they share their sharp appearance with the elves, including higher cheekbones, lean eyebrows, and some even have slight points in their ears. Passionate, eccentric, poetic, flamboyant, intelligent, witful, excellent cooks, all these things describe the Bretons. They are a people that share a very rich and very tasteful culture. Regrettably though, that is all they share. You see, politically, the Bretons are one of the most divided people on Tamriel. The power struggle amongst the various monarchs and powers of High Rock is a deeply integrated and even sometimes cherished part of Breton culture. Within the single province of High Rock, there is a plethora of kingdoms and nobility. Indeed, it is an old joke amongst the Bretons find a new hill, become a king, and many have taken it to heart. Youths of all professions and trade in High Rock spend their free time in nightly pursuits, performing good deeds and the like, in hopes to one day achieve a noble status. This quest obsession, more than anything, has served as High Rock's sense of national identity and binds its people together. On a more somber note, the social structure of the Bretons has divided itself into a poor middle class and destitute peasantry. Above them stands the magical elite, and even higher rules the noble families. Some visitors to High Rock might look at the Breton culture and dismiss it as an unfair place to be brought up. On the contrary though, many Bretons embrace this challenge by climbing the ladder to nobility. This culture and where people are raised in the pursuit of their dreams has driven the Breton race to incredible heights. We stumbled across their camp just as the morning sun rose to greet the new day. A few of them were already awake and roving the encampment carrying on their meager tasks, completely unaware that my Nordic brethren and I were watching them from the brush. They were elves, that much was clear. However, there was something different about them. I brought this up to my shield brother. An elf is an elf, 
he said. They deserve nothing but a swift death. I granted an agreement, and with that we rushed the encampment, our battle cries striking fear into the hearts of our enemies. We easily crushed the elven scum, which made what happened next that much harder to swallow. In the heat of battle, I came across one of their elders. Before I could give him a clean death, he began to wail for his life. Normally, this would only encourage me to put an end to the milk drinker cowardly enough to beg for mercy. But then, something unexpected happened. He spoke in my language. I understood him. These were no elves we were killing. These were our people. At least, they used to be. What the Nordic war party had discovered that day was a mongrel race between elf and human, the earliest form of Bretons. Upon further investigation, the Nords were able to gather that these mixed breeds were the remnants of one of their long-lost human tribes. You see, the elves had settled in High Rock centuries before man ever did. Centuries later, when the first human settlers eventually did migrate to High Rock, they were stumbling across a already highly sophisticated culture of elves, and, as is the popular trend of history, their less sophisticated human culture was quickly absorbed into a more advanced elven culture. A race would eventually emerge out of this assimilation, the race our Nordic war party had discovered, the Bretons. It took many centuries for the Bretons to become the dominant force in High Rock. The first generation of Bretons were considered second-class citizens to the purebred elves. Although they were of elven descent and thus had elder blood coursing through their veins, the infant race of Bretons weren't treated as equals. For most of the first era, the elves kept their hold on the land. Whether it be the later Breton families or early elven families, the fate of High Rock was primarily decided by the noble families throughout the ages. Of all the families that had ruled from High Rock, none did it so successfully as the clan of elves known as Clan Dereni. A powerful family in their own right, Clan Dereni was a hegemony of elven merchants who became the undisputed rulers in High Rock. With so many squabbling kingdoms, it's hard to believe anyone could tame the political puzzle that is High Rock. So to make sense of this, we need look no further than the Aliens. As it just so happens, it was the Aliens' exile from Cyrodiil that is said to have strengthened Clan Dereni. As empire builders themselves, the Aliens proved indispensable to Clan Dereni, and before long High Rock, and by extension the Bretons, fell completely under their control. So dominant were they, that by the middle of the First Era, the whole of High Rock was commonly called the Dereni Hegemony. At the peak of their power, the Dereni Hegemony controlled nearly a quarter of Tamriel, including portions of Skyrim and Hammerfell. The Dereni Hegemony was nothing short of an empire, so naturally it would one day fall. And who do you think was ready to take control of High Rock after the Elves? The Bretons. They were operating beneath the eyes of history, and their rise in High Rock was a slow and gradual one that took many generations under the Elves. After the Elven Hegemony fell, High Rock would be claimed by the Bretons, not by any act of war, but by simply being assimilated by them. Under the Elves, the Bretons had learned the art of politics, culture, and war, but the greatest lesson the Bretons took from their Elven masters was the means to assimilate and absorb other cultures. By the end of the First Era, High Rock was the land of the Bretons, and it would be forevermore. High Rock now belongs to the Bretons, but that doesn't mean they stood united as a race. As we said before, the Bretons learned many things from their elven ancestors, such as the idea of nobility and royal families. The power vacuum left by the decline of the elves fractured the Bretons into a hundred different kingdoms, fighting for a hundred different kings. The Bretons would carry on like this into the Second Era. And according to history, there was only one thing that would stop the bickering Breton nobility long enough to set aside their dreams of ambition. The Daedric Prince, Molog Bal. When an army of undead poured out of the realm of Cold Harbor to threaten Tamriel in the Second Era, the kingdoms of High Rock banded together to ensure survival. 
With the power struggle put on hold for the impending apocalypse, the Bretons pledged their loyalty to a merchant lord, High King Emmerich. The united Breton kingdoms were strong, but the Daedric threat was far too great for any one race to face alone, so the Bretons did what the Bretons do best. They used politics and diplomacy to get what they wanted. What they needed was allies, so they found them by enlisting the help of the Orcs and the Red Guards. Together, their alliance made up what came to be called the Daggerfall Covenant. The Bretons' natural gifts in magic and diplomacy served the Covenant well, and as home to the capital, High Rock wielded a considerable amount of power during this time of war. Once the threat had subsided, however, the Covenant was thrown aside and the Bretons fell back into their old traditions. High King Emmerich would go down in history as the first and only High King of the Bretons. It is now the dawning of the Third Era, marking the arrival of Tiber Septim. When the Imperials and their legions marched through the province of High Rock, they met the harsh welcome of High Rock's battle mages. For a time, some Breton kingdoms resisted the Third Empire, but knowing that their divided kingdoms wouldn't stand for long, many Bretons soon elected to join the Empire. Instead of simply being assimilated by imperial rule, the Bretons turned the tables and used their gifts and diplomacy to influence the empire they served under. Funny enough, most emperors of the Third Empire were Bretons themselves or had spent their youth in High Rock. Even under the Third Empire, internal conflicts continue to dominate High Rock. It seems even the Imperial Empire can't keep the Breton nobility from grabbing at each other's throats. In the later years of the Third Era, High Rock stood as divided as it ever was, but something was about to rock the very foundation of Nern that would redefine the province in the most mysterious of ways. They call this event the Miracle of Peace. On the 10th of Frostfall, a strange force exploded over High Rock, displacing armies and decimating whole territories. Though its nature is still unknown, most Bretons believe it was the ancient gods who had once made High Rock their home in the Adamantine Tower. They saw the bickering Breton kingdoms, and they wished to make High Rock whole once again. Though it was a painful process for most, the miracle is sometimes spoken as the warp in the West. The result was a province that was more unified than it had ever been in modern history. Where once there were a hundred bickering Breton kingdoms in High Rock, today there are three. Daggerfall, Weirist, and Orsinium. Orsinium being home to a barbaric beast race the Bretons didn't often get along with. As a matter of fact, you could say they despised each other, but as fate would have it, they would be forced to share a home in High Rock. The Orcs and the Bretons have more in common than either of them would probably like to admit. The lineage of both of their races could be traced back to the Elves, but that is a story for another day.